change and try to just blitz the crap out of people. He wants those four guys up front or three to find ways to compete and get home. They are going to have to do some 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 D tackle in twist. They're going to have to get creative, but at the same time, Joe Rossi wants to stay disciplined and they want to remain in the in the type of defense they've been in. But situations like that, they've got to get more of it right there, where they're getting the quarterback on the ground without having to sacrifice coverage. And Garcia, as good as this defense has played this season, we're now eight games in the year. And earlier this week on the PJ Flex show. The Gopher head coach said he's still expressing his desire for more pressure to be put on opposing quarterbacks. It feels like we've heard a similar theme, even though they've played very well defensively. The head coach is hoping to see more sacks. How do they make that happen, Justin? Well, the way they design it and the way they want to, guys, is they want to get more pressure from the inside guys, right? The defensive tackles in there. They, they, then, then that will allow you know them the edge the edge rushers like a Thomas Rush and maybe even the linebackers to get home a little bit. I thought it got a little bit better against Rutgers a week ago. They forced their quarterback out of the pocket a couple of times. He made a couple of plays, but that to me is the biggest Achilles heel right now for the defense. Secondary we know is outstanding. Linebackers we know are outstanding. Defensive line, when you lose a couple of guys to the NFL, it's hard to replace, and they just haven't been able to do that enough. But they have gotten better. Nebraska's offensive line, by the way, guys, has given up the most pressures in the Big Ten, so it should be a case of using Nebraska's weaknesses to help show up yours today. Now on the offensive side of the ball, guys, it's no secret that Muhammad Ibrahim is the straw that stirs the drink for the Minnesota offense. In the past two games, Ibrahim has carried it a total of 66 times. That is a heavy workload for a running back coming off an Achilles injury. Granted, we asked him after the game against Rutgers if he's okay with that amount of workload. Doesn't seem to bother him any. Guys, can the Gophers continue to ride Ibrahim the way they have the past couple of weeks? Ron, we'll start with you. Yeah, I, I think so. And when you look at the Gophers, we talked about that. 1,700 yards rushing, second in the Big Ten. When you look at Nebraska's defense, they are last in the Big Ten, giving up 1,500 yards, over 1,500 yards this year so far. So if I'm P.J. Fleck, and, and J.G. knows I hate these type of games, but, hey, if we want to win, this is how you do it. You <laughs> have to grind this clock out. You have to ride Mo. When we talk about this offensive line, later uh, you'll understand when, when I break it down for you but this offensive line against Penn State it was questionable they turned around and just had a lights out game I'm talking about inside zone outside zone you're talking about middle zone everything was working and Mo Ibrahim's vision was the best and so that's the way to do it when you talk about Mo it's the, the amount of guys he doesn't take hits from that means he's getting through clean before he takes his first hit. That's going to be the key to the rest of the season. Justin, no concern with the amount of work he's had so far over these last few weeks? Oh, there's concern for sure. I mean, 60 carries, like you mentioned, can he hold up? Now, I'm curious how they play it today because, as Ron mentioned, Nebraska's defense statistically is not very good. When interim head coach Mickey Joseph got the job, one of the first things he did was make a move at defensive coordinator. They rank in the basically bottom 20 in FBS football in almost every defensive category. So I think the Gophers actually today are going to start throwing the ball a little bit. I think they're going to go back to the non-conference where they threw the ball to set up the run. If you're worried about the workload, here's a prop for you guys. I got my Mo Ibrahim Gushers right here <laughs> oh, love off those. of his uh, NIL deal from earlier in the week. So if he needs a little jump, uh, maybe I'll give it to the receivers, Ron, like you said, they don't have much of a workload on this team. Maybe they can give these to Mo. But um, it's definitely, I think, going to be a little bit more balanced today because you know Nebraska is going to try to stop Mo like they tried to stop Chase Brown last week. You know, I got to talk to Mo because every time I go shopping, Gushers are always off the shelf. I can never find him, so he's probably buying them all out. I got to see if I can, you know, snake a deal with him and get some Gushers. Uh, the season doesn't end today, guys, but with a win, the Gophers will become bowl eligible for the fourth time in the past five years. And I think, you know, we know that if they win, today nobody here believes that they'll think oh we got six wins you know that's enough of an accomplishment but when you study the history of this program bowl eligibility in four out of five years is certainly something to hang your hat on and something to feel good about right Justin well, I use Nebraska as an example. I don't know if you can see behind me, but they've got national championships here, right? As recently as 1997. They haven't been to a bowl game since 2017. That's almost impossible in 2022 to have a bowl streak this long. Um, so for the Gophers to be able to consistently go to bowls, really going back to when Jerry Kill got here in 2011, PJ's obviously taking it to that next level. Yeah, in the grand scheme of things, is it amazing to go to you know kind of a second tier bowl every year? No, probably not. But if you look at it in totality, you mix in an Outback Bowl, you mix in a bowl in Phoenix, you mix in a bowl in Nashville this year, who knows? You look back at it and you go, okay, this is a program that is stable. It's a program that has aspirations for higher things, but you got to 
start with that consistency, and that's what the Gophers have. And a program that you want to be talked about at the end of the year, no doubt. Yeah, and when you think about it, going back to Glenn Mason even, Glenn Mason went to eight bowl games in ten years, and so you think about that feat along, you know, with eight win, nine win seasons, ten win seasons. P.J. Fleck is doing the same thing, building the same culture, and, and now he's just added his roll the boat to it. And when you think about that, P.J.'s recruiting opportunity, more practices for some of these young guys, uh, more coaching opportunities for guys like Joe Rossi and Kenny Burns. I think that's the key for this team and uh, Matt Simon, the receivers coach. That's the key for this team to be able to grow and then get more kids in here to visit. Uh, uh, kids seeing that, like, hey, we're going to go to a bowl game. This is a school I want to go to. So I think, you know, we can talk about second tier, first tier, whatever, but at the end of the day, you could either be Nebraska, you could be Minnesota, and I think most people would choose Minnesota. As of right now, I can't say I would disagree with that whatsoever. We're just getting started here on the Gopher pregame show. When we come back, we'll take a closer look at today's opponent, the Cornhuskers of Nebraska, have shown a lot of fight this season. How difficult will it be to get past Nebraska? We'll discuss that on the other side of the break. Nineteen fifty five. You're watching the Gopher pregame show. And welcome back, everybody, to the Gopher pregame show, getting you ready for kickoff here between the Gophers and the Cornhuskers. We know it's been an eventful season for Nebraska. They fired head coach Scott Frost just three games into the season. They have gone two and three since then. When you look at this team, particularly on offense, Casey Thompson has been the man under center all year, but he's currently dealing with an arm injury that knocked him out of last week's game. 
Chubba Purdy and Logan, Logan Smothers each saw action at quarterback in last week's loss against Illinois. Guys, if Thompson plays, Justin, I'm going to start with you since you're there. He's likely not going to be at 100%, which could be a big advantage for Minnesota. Yeah, I think the prevailing wisdom down here, guys, is people would be surprised if Thompson played today. He did get back. He did get the feeling back in his hand, first of all, which is a scary situation after Saturday's game against Illinois. Did a little bit of practicing this week. I think he's going to dress this morning and maybe go through some warm-ups, but similar to Tanner Morgan at Penn State, they'd be surprised if he played today. And as a lot of people have told me down here, Nebraska's kind of gone as Casey Thompson is gone. You mentioned Purdy, the backup quarterback, kind of a hand-picked transfer by Mark Whipple, the offensive coordinator from Florida State. So he'd be likely to start if Thompson can't go, and it seems like that's the direction that they're heading. And that's really affected the line in this game. You see that Minnesota's every fa a heavy yes, favorite, and, and, and for good reason. Again, Ron, if Thompson can't play, I mean, this is going to be a big advantage for Minnesota. Yeah, I mean, you see here, he's a, he's a guy that's going to – he's exciting. He's going to make the big play. Play. He's going to make the big throw. He can run. He can move. Um, you know, when you – and again, it's like going from Tanner Morgan to Ethan Kelly McManus. It's not like Kelly McManus is not good. It's just he hasn't had the opportunities. And so I think it's the same thing here. Casey Thompson's the guy. He's the guy that's been getting them going all season. So, I mean, at this point, if it is Purdy, I, I really think that this offense is going to get condensed even more and because what they're thinking is we don't want to make mistakes. But if they open that playbook up and say, hey, you know what, what's the worst that could happen? Then let's look for Tyler Newbin to have him another interception day or, you know, another guy, you know, whether it's Justin Wally or somebody, because you can really confuse a quarterback who hasn't played as much if the coaches don't reel them in. And so that'll be interesting to see how they handle that. And if Thompson can't play, the Huskers will no doubt lean on their run game even more. But Nebraska has been a pretty good, uh, they've got a pretty good running back in Anthony Grant. He's averaging just five yards a carry, just shy of five yards a carry, rather. He's got six rushing touchdowns on the year. The Gophers only allowed 48 yards on the ground of Rutgers last week. How key is it to try to slow down Anthony Grant in this Nebraska running attack, Ron? Yeah, I think you want to win on first and second down. We look at the Gophers' third down defense right now. They're third uh, in the nation, I think, and then first in the Big Ten. But, you know, third down defense, they're 20, they've allowed 24.4% on third down, which is first in the Big Ten. And so when you look at this defense and how they force teams, it's forcing them into longer situations. When you run the ball, that means you're getting what you want on first and second down. That opens up the playbook on third down. If you can force them into third and long, I, I don't think care who's a quarterback against this defense. I think this defense can really handle them the same way they handled Rutgers last week. And Justin, Nebraska is playing with a backup quarterback. I mean, you got to think that Minnesota is going to start stacking that box just a little bit more to to try to take away that ground game, I would imagine. I would think so. Now, Nebraska's receiving core is pretty good, led by Trey Palmer, who has nine catches of 30 yards or more. He's an explosive player. He's an absolute problem, and he's a slot receiver, which Ron will tell you, Minnesota really hasn't had to deal with this season. They haven't had to deal with a really explosive slot receiver. So I know Joe Rossi's concerned about that. And the deal with Nebraska, with this Scott Frost, Mark Whipple offense, it's all about explosive plays. The drives where they have a play of 15, 20 yards, they frequently score, and they frequently score, score pretty quickly. So for the Gophers, the script remains the same. It's limiting those explosive plays and making Nebraska drive down the field at a slower pace. Yeah, and Justin's right. When you look at Trey Palmer, he's you know almost 100 yards a game. He's 12th in the nation when he's on the Belitnikoff watch list. And so I think in the slot, the biggest key for that is who's covering the slot, and that's where guys get confused because it's the linebacker's responsibility, it's the safety's responsibility, and it's the nickel's responsibility. All three of those guys have to talk, and then if they run a bunch of some nasty splits where everybody's kind of closer to the lot, to the uh, tackle or the tight end, then it even gets even worse because that's when you see, like, even the Vikings do it with Justin Jefferson. You run that out and up or that, that, that slant and go. That's when you can really – or the fade seam, which you see it right here. That's when it can get bad because if one guy miscommunicates and doesn't understand who has the slot guy and who has the man, he can get wide open like that because that's what you want to do. You want to split those safeties and force them to make a mistake. Yeah, guys, and it's funny that you bring him up because earlier in the week on the P.J. Flex show, the Gophers head coach was quite complimentary towards wide receiver Trey Palmer. You know, a lot to like with this young man. Like you guys were saying, 48 passes on the year, nearly 800 yards, five scores. We've talked all season long about how good 
uh, this Minnesota secondary has been, but they are going to have their hands full with Palmer Day, aren't they, Ron? Oh, yeah. I mean, like you said, you just saw the complimentary routes he can run. And the one that I like the most that he does is when he goes down the middle of the seam and he's trying to get to that corner, he has the nastiest head and shoulder move to make you think he's going to go in, and then he's going to break it to the corner. And then he has a choice route where he can do the opposite, where he can fake corner and go back post. And so that's going to be a big day for Tyler Newbin and Howden because they cannot get set up. I always joke about the banana in the tailpipe. Eddie Murphy, you, you guys remember that movie? I'm a Detroit guy, so I love it. But you cannot fall for that. You his, his hips won't lie. Like Shakira told us, the hips don't lie. Don't look at the head and the eyes. Watch his hips. His hips can't go anywhere. The rest of his body's not trying to go. But everybody loves to look at those eyes. And just like when you look at Rick James' eyes, just like Charlie Murphy said, hey, it's like an aura. And you get stuck in it. Or Prince. Sorry, it was Prince that had the aura. <laughs> Absolutely. And you look at Prince's eyes, and you're like, oh, man, I, I, I just forgot what I was going to say. And so you cannot look at the eyes. Watch the hips. Play your route. And don't, don't get sucked into a trick. Justin, have your hips ever lied? <laughs> My hips certainly do not lie. Um, I go nowhere without them. I am so confused on which reference we were supposed to follow there for Ron. I hope, <laughs> let me say this. I hope Joe Rossi's instructions are a little bit cleaner than Ron's were there. It's I hope that hips, the whiteboard. They won't Ron, lie in his, in his yeah, prince's eyes. Hips, we don't look at James, the eyes. <laughs> Charlie Murphy. Don't forget Axel the Foley in there. Hey. Man. hey. Don't forget and Axel Foley, uh, Beverly Hills Will Cop. Judge Bradley Bradley Murphy, yeah. when he yeah. was acting like he was Rick oh, James yeah. and had, Absolutely. The, had the aura around him. <laughs> there is plenty of aura around this show, I can tell you that for right now. We're going to wave goodbye to Justin Gard, who's running off to take care of his radio duties. Justin, we appreciate it as always, my man. We will see you. Hey, Justin, you whatever you do, don't ever put your feet on Eddie Murphy's couch. That's yeah, don't do that. that, that's for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Got it. Thanks yeah. for the advice. All right. Thanks, Justin. All right, stick around, everybody. When we come back, Ron and I will highlight some comeback performances we saw from the Gophers last week. That is coming up next on the Gopher pregame show. General Keith Ellison, the right choice for us. Welcome back to the Gopher pregame show. Welcome back, everybody. You were looking at a live picture out at Memorial Stadium in Lincoln, Nebraska, as the Gophers get set for kickoff against the Cornhuskers later today. Kickoff scheduled 
for 11 o'clock. Welcome back in studio, everybody. Pierre Newsham, Ron Johnson here with you. Going to break down some of the key plays that we saw last week against Rutgers, and it was a nice comeback performance from the Minnesota Gophers, after, especially after last month. And, of course, we talked about it in, in, earlier in the show. Mo Ibrahim, how can you not love him? He does these Mr. Everything for this Gopher team. What do you like in this situation here with Minnesota? Yeah, well, PJ Fleck talks about response. So these are Ron's response players of the week. My response player of the week is not Mo. Mo's going to do the work. Yeah. But it's this group right here. This offensive line, when you watch this, you got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven in the box. This guy's going to insert himself late. For Tanner Morgan, you draw a line down. You're going to count three here. You're going to count four late. This guy has to let these guys do their job. And they're going to have an, uh, uh, a zone read. Basically, they're going to try to move the entire line to the left. Mo cuts it back right. Why? Because pre-snap, he was able to read that there was four to the left, three to the right. You'll see it here. He walks down late number four. Mo sees him. Boom. I'm going backside. Big number 87 gets up there on the second level, so Mo doesn't have to take a secondary hit. Receivers are blocking. That offensive line is doing a great job. We're going to see it again on the next play. When you think about the next play, it's the same thing. You got the same count. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. This guy here. That's your key. Mo is going to read. He's not going to get hit until somewhere back there. That's why I like Mo in this offensive line. Though. Watch them move the entire line. Everybody's moving. Boom. Mo cuts it. He takes it front side. He is doing a great job of just getting through. And that's not the one play I was looking for, but we'll figure it out. The next one coming up, you'll see it on the other end. Here it is. There it is. You got Tyler Newbin. So my response player is Tyler Newbin. Why? Because Penn State was able to do what they did. Tyler Newbin this week said, you know what? I'm going to be the difference maker. You're going to have Tyler Newbin here. He's going to make the play over here. Watch how much ground he covers. He's just in quarters coverage. He's reading the quarterback's eyes in quarters. There's nobody def def uh, this affecting his quarter. So he's like, you know what? Screw this. I'm going to go get the ball. <laughs> and that's what I love about him playing quarters is if nobody's, is nobody's threatening your quarter of the field, Go make a play. Absolutely. And that's what he does there. He goes and makes a play. He covers a lot of ground, and that's why he's one of the best safeties in the Big Ten. And then you got the next one. Same thing. It's going to be another quarter's look. Tyler's way back here. He's just going to read it. He's going to come up. You're going to see a tip. You got three on two and three. Tyler, this you would think this guy's going to make the play. Right. Oh, it's this guy making the play. Why? Because he's a playmaker. And that's why he's my response player of the week for the defense. You'll see it. They're going to run vertical. You got a shallow quarterback throws it tip. Boom. There he is making another play. And that's what gets his defense going. He said when he's on the PJ Fleck show, I want to be the guy to get my defense going. I want to be the guy that they follow me. And you'll see the quarterback's yeah, eyes. He's going to read the eyes. Up. That quarterback never looked anywhere else but there. So Mariana Sori Marion with the tip. He gets part of the helmet sticker. But Tyler Newbin, you get the helmet sticker with Ron's response player of the week. On defense. I mean, two, Tyler Newbin. two interceptions for Tyler Newbin last week, and that we talked about it in the previous segment. You know, Casey Thompson may not be starting here today for Nebraska at quarterback, and this is a big opportunity. Again, the secondary, we've talked about this secondary all season long, a real strength of this team, and another big opportunity for them today to perhaps take advantage of a quarterback with not much experience. Yeah, and, and, and stuff like that can happen. When you go in quarters coverage, and to understand what that means, people, you just take the field, you split it up into fours. Everybody has, each corner has a quarter, two safeties have a quarter. If nobody threatens his quarter that's when it's time to go do what he's doing and that's get get sneaky find out where the quarterback's looking and let him take it to the quarter to the ball and don't don't let the quarterback trick you but I don't think this is a kid that's going to trick you if, if it was Drew Brees if it was Tom Brady Peyton Manning I'd be worried about that sure no doubt about it I don't think this kid is going to do it for Nebraska so you can get a little bit sneaky and follow yeah. his eyes and he'll take it to the ball and I don't think a defense expects to have a shutout every single time it goes out on the field. But Minnesota has two shutouts so far this season. That's the first time that's happened since 2004, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, potential here for – not gonna. I'm not predicting a shutout, don't get me wrong, but potential here for a low-scoring yeah, game. Yeah, pause it here. Yeah. So this is why. You can have a shutout here because of this look. When you have, like PJ said, one, two, three, four, and he doesn't have to do anything special. Yeah. They're going to get pressure on this guy, which is why he steps up a little early. His eyes never come off that spot. He's looking here. This guy here is part of the play. And then we know Tyler Newbin back there was part of the play. That's exactly why you can pitch a shutout is that those three guys – you got three guys making him throw the ball a little bit sooner, sure. which puts eight in the coverage. If you do the math, and I'm a good mathematician because I graduated college, 
Eight minus 11 yeah. is three. They only rush three guys, and they still found a way to get home. So that's what P.J. Fleck wants. He wants to put seven to eight guys back there sometimes because stuff like that happens. Yeah. There's nowhere to throw the ball, and if one guy can pressure him, hey, you got a ball game. Ron Johnson, mathematical genius. <laughs> Don't mistake it, everybody. When we come back, we sit down with the Swiss Army knife. That is Derek LeCaptain. That and more coming up next. Nineteen fifty five. You're watching the Gopher pregame show. Welcome back into the Gopher pregame show, everybody. Special guest joining us now. I, I'm not really sure how to characterize his position, so we'll just call him Mr. Do It All, Derek LeCaptain, joining us here on the Gopher pregame show. Do you have a designated position at this point? Uh, I'm a linebacker. Uh, uh, I've, I've always said I'm a linebacker, okay. but <clears throat> yeah, I'm still. Still play play multiple positions. We see on offense, we see on defense, we see on special teams. Um, linebacker, as you say, is still the primary position. We've seen you get on the field this year so far. What has it been like playing with this group leading up to this point in the season with the way you guys have had? Uh, it's been amazing. I mean, since January, we've just talked about how special this team is. Uh, not just even not just on the field, but off the field. Just our connectivity uh, is crazy, and we have. A lot of great, great fifth and sixth year guys who are just awesome leaders. You know, you got Tanner, he's been here forever. Chris, Mariano, Brev, it, John Michael. It, it's, it's really special, special group to be a part of. You guys just recently snapped out of a three-game losing streak back in the win column. What was the conversation like after the game against Rutgers and with the way you guys performed? Um, you know, it for us, it's all, it's all about. You know, we take our result from Saturday, we come back Sunday, we dissect it, see what we did well, see what we got to improve on, and then. Uh, and then it's on to the next week, you know, so can never be too high, can never be too low with our wins and our losses. It's we just stick to our process, you know, changing our best, executing the game plan next week better than we did the week before. So it was but it was it was awesome. Great. Just great to be uh, back in the win column with the guys. Defensively, it's another shutout for you guys. Here. That's two shutouts on the uh, the program hasn't done that since 2006. Um, I, I know that's probably 
maybe not something that comes to the top of the player's head, but when you hear something like that with two shout-outs on the season, I'm sure that's got to be a pretty good feeling for a yeah, defensive player. Yeah, yeah, it's awesome. Um, you know, for us, it's like I said before, uh, that was our result, but we still we had to dissect a lot of stuff. We did a lot of stuff well, a lot of stuff we had to clean up, and then it's like I said before, we're focusing on executing this week's game plan better than last week's, but it was awesome. You mentioned Joe Rossi. You guys have been very consistent on the defensive side of the ball this year, particularly in the secondary as well. What has allowed this group to just play to such a high level this season? Yeah, I, I, I really think it's the standard that we have on defense. You know, Coach Rossi sets the standard uh, for what our defense needs to look like, and that's echoed in the position groups by every position coach and then by us as players. And I think it's awesome you got Jay Howe and Noob in the safeties room. You know, they're leading the charge for them. You got Mariano who's played a ton of ball leading the charge for us. And then you got guys up front, you know, Trill, Thomas Rush, all those guys leading the charge. So it's really just cool. There's so much leadership at each position and it comes together. And with our coaching staff, it makes for really a lot of fun and just a great group to be around. Yeah, you said there's a lot of leadership at, at every position. How beneficial is that? You know, to like you can just turn around and look at the room and you say there's a leader here, here, and here. How beneficial is that? Yeah, it's it's super beneficial because, like I said, you know, when we're in practice and stuff, and if if it isn't how it needs to be, you know, leadership is there, and we're it's coach always talks about being player led, and I think that's one thing about this year's team is we are very player led, and I think. Uh, that's a huge reason uh, why we're playing as well as well. Your next opponent is Nebraska, who we're looking forward to seeing you guys go up against here later today. What has been the big challenge when you study them on tape and you look at the Huskers and think to yourself, man, we really got to be really good in these areas here? Yeah, yeah, they, they have great athletes all over the place. You know, it's one of the greatest programs in college football. They got a lot of tradition. Uh, really good coaching staff, you know, so we just got to come to play, um, keep preparing, and that's the biggest thing this week, just keep preparing because they do have a lot of great players, great athletes, great offense, great defense, they're good on special teams, so it'll be a good challenge. You guys were unsuccessful in the last two road games that you played. However, you did have a very good performance earlier in the season against Michigan State in East Lansing. What are some of the tricks and keys maybe to win on the road and some of the challenges that that brings? Yeah, I mean, I think for us uh, – you know, it doesn't matter where we play. We, we, we're always going to play our style of ball, you know. And one thing we always say is home is where we go together. So as long as we're together, we're rowing together, you know, all the players, staff, everybody's in it together. It doesn't matter where we play. We're just playing ball. For yourself personally, how have you seen your game grow, yourself grow during the time of the program? Where do you want to see yourself by the time your time at Minnesota is over? Yeah, it's, you know, just kind of sitting here thinking about it. Uh, in year four, it's crazy how, time the, how fast the time has gone. Um, for me, I just want to continue to be somebody who can be trusted uh, when I'm put in positions, make plays, and be as best as I can for the team. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about. It's all about the team. And any way that I can help the team, whether it's on offense, defense, or special teams, uh, I'm up for it. So. And you've done that very thing in all the three phases. You have been called upon. Is is there an area that you like particularly best? Is something you get hyped up for a little bit more? Or is it just, hey, you put me in, I just want to be on the football yeah, field? Yeah, I, I just love it all. Any any chance to be on the field with the guys, I'll take it. It doesn't matter if it's OD or special teams. Any chance to step out on the field on a Saturday with the guys is, is special. You guys have four games left in, in the regular season. What do you want to see from this group from now till the end of the season? Uh, honestly, just keep doing what we're doing. It's it's an honor to be able to take the field with these guys and be with these coaches. So, uh, you know, just soak up every single moment we have together because like we were talking about with Coach today, we have, I think we have 26 days left of the regular season. So really just embrace every moment with each other in meetings, in practice, in the hotel before the games, out of the facility. That's, that's the biggest thing um, I think I want us to do is just really embrace each other. And you want to talk about a guy that, you know, magnifies the oar in the water mentality. It's Derek LeCaptain. If you recall last year, we saw the video that went viral of him getting on scholarship in a team meeting. It was really a great moment for him and the team. Just a guy whose motor just does not stop running, no matter if he's playing offense, defense, or special teams. He's really a heartbeat of this team, I would say. Yeah, and when you think about, like, last year and years before that, when running backs were getting hurt, Derek LeCaptain came in. Everybody yeah. on the team was excited. He was coming in to play running back. Everybody was rooting for him. That's the kind of guys you need. I mean, he's not a Rudy because he, he's actually, you know, on the team. Sure, sure. But, you know, it gives you that kind of, like, inspiration. Like, man, this is a guy that we see every day work hard in practice, never complains, always does what he's supposed to do. Was You know, I think PJ does that, too, that when you, sh when you reward a guy, it shows other people that are walk-ons or preferred walk-ons. Like, hey, if I just do my job every day, if I just work hard, if I'm a team first player, if I'm a 
coachable guy. If I'm a if I'm a player that all the coaches can trust me when they close their eyes and go to bed at night, they're not going to wake up and find me on the da -da -da or whatever <laughs> or the ticker or yeah. you know some police report. Yeah. Hey, that's what the culture is about, and he's bought into it, and it's paid off for him. He's, you know, he's had a great or a good career here, and he's going to walk away with a, a college degree. He's, yep. he's going to have no debt around it. I mean, what else can you ask for? Not really much of it all, but like we said, we've seen him on special teams. We've seen him on offense. But, however, like he re reiterated to me, linebacker is what I love to do. <laughs> I like to get out there, put a hat on people, and we certainly love watching Derek LeCaptain in action. Hey, for as him well. though, like yeah. never overlook fullback because there's not That's a lot right. of fullbacks in the NFL. And literally, I mean, CJ Ham, yep. Hughes Check, I think there's like four. Yeah. If he ends it's up a getting start. a chance to try it and you like to hit people, fullback goes away to hit people that want to hit you. So it's like an absolute collision. So I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't overlook it. Linebackers that don't make it a linebacker, special teams. Yeah, no doubt. back, you know, do, being a do-it-all guy in the NFL is huge when you only have 53. So, Derek, the captain might want to. And Yeah, uh, yeah he's certainly. Hold and, on. And, kids, if you want to pop in some classic uh, fullback tape, pop in some tape of Lorenzo Neal from back in the day. Oh, that yeah. guy <laughs> was a baller. You can make a living as a good fullback in the National Football League. When we return on the Gopher pregame show, we'll take a look around the Big Ten. We'll discuss some of the big games happening today. That is coming up next on the Gopher pregame show. CC is responsible for the content of this advertising. Welcome back to the Gopher Pregame Show. Thanks for staying with us here on the Gopher Pregame Show, everybody. Live picture here at Memorial Stadium as we count you down to kickoff between the Gophers and the Cornhuskers. Kickoff scheduled 
for 11 o'clock. Time now to take a look around the Big Ten this weekend. Let's start with a game that uh, I don't really think we, we need to spend all that much time on this game, but we're going to anyway. Number two, Ohio State on the road taking on Northwestern. No disrespect to the Wildcats, but this game, Ron, uh, likely to be over perhaps by halftime after today. The next two games for Ohio State is home against Indiana, then at Maryland. The Terps might keep things interesting for a while, but if Ohio State isn't undefeated going into the regular season finale uh, with Michigan, I personally would be quite stunned. Yeah, Ohio State's going to run through them. We know, I mean, and again, nothing against Northwestern, but they, they have no shot. They're 1-7 right now. I, I just think they're in a rebuild mode, which is weird in college because you're always recruiting. But Ohio State, when you, when you think about what they are, who they are, it's, it's that. It's yeah. big play after big play. I, my guess is they're going to want to put up because now when you see Tennessee at the top, you see Georgia up there, you see Clemson up there, you see Ohio State, Michigan's like on the outside looking in. You got Alabama still trying to creep back in. Uh, Ohio State has to win convincingly to make sure they stay because now they're learning this committee is like screw records. We're just going to go with the eye test from now on because I know what I want in this final. And so they have to pass this eye test with Northwestern. They have to beat their heads in. And it, I mean, they're, they're going to want to put up 50 points. And I, I feel bad for Northwestern, but it's, it, it's, it's going to be one of those games, I think. They very well could put up 50 points in that game. There's no doubt about it. Elsewhere in the Big Ten, break up the Hawkeyes. Uh, they're coming off a game in which the offense scored 33 points. That was a season high. Granted, it was against Northwestern, and today <laughs> they're going to have a tougher challenge as they take on Purdue. Can Iowa keep the momentum going offensively, Ron? I think so, but I don't think it's going to happen. Like, I just don't think Brian Ferentz, I, I think Brian Ferentz, uh, when you think about the NFL and the schemes they run and those type of players, I think in his mind, you know, they had it going for a little bit with Iowa. They were running the ball well. They were using the tight ends. They just don't have that right now. Yeah. They don't have the tight end he's used to having. They don't have the run game that he's used to using. So you can't run play action if you've only gained two yards in the first seven plays. And I think that's the problem with his offense. Defensively, I think they're okay. They're, they're, they're doing just enough. But offensively, they can't keep up with some of these teams. So, it, Purdue, it's about which Purdue team shows up. Purdue against Minnesota looked really good. Purdue against others has not. So, if the Purdue that showed up against Minnesota was hitting on all cylinders, yeah, I, they win against Iowa, no problem. Purdue still chasing Illinois in that Big Ten West. So, yeah, certainly a big game for Purdue, no doubt about it. Maryland is coming off a bye. The Terps are 6-2. and two. They played some pretty good football this season. Today, they head, to, they head to Camp Randall to take on the Badgers. Is the season going to go from bad to Two worse for Wisconsin, Ron. Uh, this is a tough one for me. Uh, Talia Tagovailoa, it, he's a dynamic weapon of a player. Uh, he gives you a different, you know, type of movement. Now, Jim Leonard, though, since he's taken over, this Wisconsin team has been playing pretty stout. They're playing loose. The offense looks a little bit more carefree. When you have a guy like Braylon Allen, there's no reason, reason not to run him the same way the Gophers run Mo Ibram. And I think that's what Jim Leonard probably was trying to get back to Paul Chris. I, I think they were, at, they, they were at a crossing roads where it's like, what is this team going to look like? And cross over to the wrong territory. I mean, he and he ended up fired. I think Jim Leonard is the guy for the job long term. I mean, if I'm Wisconsin, I'm definitely going to offer Jim okay. Leonard's job. Okay. Uh, but they're they're playing at a different clip right now. But again, it's up to the running game. If Wisconsin can run the ball, they win this game. Are you picking Wisconsin to win this game? I don't know. I, I can't pick Wisconsin <laughs> to win anything. But I mean, that so, run game to me is just so good. Like yeah, if they if they get sure. it going. It's good. And Jim Leonard, I mean, Ravens background, Jets background. When you think about the defensive coordinators he's been around, he knows how to get a team to do what he wants. And sometimes a defensive coordinator can't do exactly what he wants because the head coach is like, oh, right. Out. Don't do yeah. that. Don't no, do that. Yeah, now he doesn't have that. Yeah. Now he's like, hey, right. put six guys in the box, put two safeties down. You guys crisscross, confuse the hell out of the quarterback, and go after him. So it's a lot different now in Wisconsin than it was with Paul Chris. No doubt about it. All right, a couple more ranked Big Ten teams in action today, including number 15, Penn State, on the road taking on Indiana. The Nittany Lions looking to bounce back from last week's tough loss against Ohio State. Ron, what are we looking for in this matchup here between Penn State and Indiana? Uh, Penn State's going to try to go off because uh, Ohio State is the best team in the Big Ten, if not one of the best teams in the country, in my opinion. I think I would love to see them versus Tennessee, but I don't know if we're going to get that. Um, that would be but, spicy. But you, you got one of the best teams in the country they played against, and they played them well yeah. like, through the first half. Yeah. 
Um, and so when you think about this Indiana Penn State game again there they want to try to put themselves in a position that if anything were to falter with Michigan Ohio State that they're right there uh, probably not going to get in the Big Ten Championship because how strong the East is, is going to sure. be Ohio State or yeah. Michigan but you know can put position themselves to be in one of the bigger bowl games sure. whether it's the Outback or something like that and that's that's their goal right now number 16 Illinois back home today hosting Michigan State Illinois a 17 point favorite in this one Ron they play great defense and I would imagine that trend will continue later today. Everybody keeps saying Mel Tucker's coming. I think that was like the Michigan State model at the beginning. Of the year. He hasn't come yet. Like, no. I, I don't know what's going on. He hasn't been there. Uh, the fight, yeah, they can fight. They can win a fight with helmets. Sure. But as far as football <laughs> right now, Mel Tucker doesn't have them going. Like, I don't know what it is. You do. He did lose a lot of pieces uh, to the NFL. You did lose one of the big Kenneth, Kenneth Walker Jr. Or the third or junior. Uh, lost one of the best running backs in the Big Ten to the NFL. So, it's tough to rebuild sometimes. PJ, you know, we just Gar brought it up about PJ flecking that defensive line and that offensive line, losing guys in the NFL. It's tough to replace some of these key and receivers. I mean, you lost yeah. Rashad Bateman, Tyler Newman, or uh, Rashad Bateman, Tyler Johnson over the last couple of years. Chris Altman bailed out with injury. Sure. Replacing guys is not easy, and that's what Mel Tucker's dealing with right now. Yeah, and one more game left. Uh, Michigan at Rutgers. We figured, you know, didn't really have to spend all that much time on that one, especially the way we saw Rutgers. I mean, best of luck to Rutgers. But I think Ron and I are both picking Michigan in that game. Just, there, there you have it. We're not done here on the Gopher <laughs> pregame show. When we come back, we'll give you our keys to victory as we get you ready for Minnesota and Nebraska. That is next on the Gopher pregame show. I don't show. even know what the hell to the victor song is. <laughs> I think I just did I like that hat, Dame. though. I think I did the Notre Dame song. You're watching the Gopher pregame show. Winding things down here on the Gopher pregame show. There you have it right there. Memorial Stadium as Minnesota gets set to take on Nebraska kickoff in just over an hour from now. Time now to get to our keys to victory. Justin Gard had to run and take care of his radio duty. So 
I'll do this read on his behalf. Justin says his key to the game today, take advantage of the Nebraska secondary. The Cornhuskers ranked dead last in the Big Ten in terms of pass defense, giving up nearly 270 yards a game through the air. It is a weakness on their team, and Minnesota would be wise to try to exploit that. So that is Mr. Guard's key to victory. Ron your key to victory today, sir. Well, my key is also exploit their weaknesses. They are weak everywhere, so I'm going to go <laughs> opposite with my weakness. My weakness is the run game. You look at their give, they've given up 1,520, 21 yards this year. That's last in the Big Ten. They've also faced 631 plays. That is the most plays. What? Fa any defense has faced 631? 631 plays. That's on, you're on the field way too long, people. That means you're not getting off on third down. So, Mikey, take the air out the ball. Suffocate this team. Do not let their offense get on the field. How do you do that? Give the ball to Mo. Mo knows. Mo has gushers. Let Mo yes. gush through that offensive line and then pop some candy when he gets back on the sideline. Let that defensive line do what they do. Maw people. Go forward. This is what you do. When you take the air out of the stadium, that means the run game is so good, the crowd can't even cheer. They're sitting on their hands. They're going to get nachos, and they're trying to find their next ear of corn to go bite and put some salt on it. <laughs> my, key to, my key to victory is play suffocating offense. What I mean by that is sustained drives. Sure, it would be great if we could just throw the ball once and get a 75-yard touchdown pass or see Mo break off a 75-yard touchdown run. That would be great. But if you go back to last week, Ron, Minnesota's first offensive drive of the game, what was it? 19 plays on 99 yards took over 10 minutes off the clock. You build long drives like that, and you're going to wear down a defense and absolutely take this crowd out of the game. So sustain drives, don't give them any hope, and make life hard for Nebraska's defense. Suffocate any signs of hope. That is my key to victory today. All right, before we get to the matchup meter, we want to tell you to download the Fox Bet Super 6 app for your chance at winning $25,000. Fox Bet Super 6 is a free-to-play contest where you pick the winners and margins of victory of six marquee matchups. If you get all six right in the college football contest, you have a shot of winning the $25,000 jackpot. Open the app, make your picks before Saturday's games all kick off. All right, it is now time for the one and only matchup meter, Ron Johnson. Ron, let's blow right through this thing. What do you got, my friend? I will say this. We were all on the same page with our keys, like, and we didn't even talk about it. That's like, true. That's, that was very, very, like, that was, uh, what's that show on Netflix everybody watches where it gets weird? Uh, Stranger Things. Yeah, that, that was Stranger Things-esque. Like, I felt like we were in each other's ceilings and walls because mm -hmm. Justin's was their week. I said their week and to, like, take the air out of them. And then Pierre just comes and kills everybody and suffocates yep. himself. I did. Uh, we, were, we, we were on point. There. We're a well-oiled machine here. <laughs> Make no mistake about so it. So this is going to be the most simple, simplest, I'd say. Offensively, we already said that Nebraska's defense is the worst. So we know offensively and defensively, I got to give that to the, to the Gophers' edge because Nebraska just hasn't done it. They fired their coach. The coaching is easy. They fired him. Like, how can I say a coach that's on the street somewhere is better than P.J. Fleck? Mikey Joseph, I think he's doing a good job, but he's not better than P.J. Fleck in this matchup. P.J. Fleck has, earned, or has owned Nebraska, and so I, I think that's the key to this. I got to give the edge to P.J. Fleck and his coaching staff. We look at Kenny Burns. You look at Matt Simon. You look at Kirk Shiraka, Joe Rossi. They are better than the Nebraska supporting staff as well. I'm going to say the Gophers athletic trainers are probably a little bit better. I mean, it's just they, they tape their tape better. They, they, their uniforms look better. They're better <laughs> than the guy that, 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 that picked their uniform out for the week. They're, their equipment managers are better. Like, it's just all going Gophers way for this one. But the X factor, I am going to give this to Nebraska because Mikey Joseph, literally, I don't know if anybody, I know Pierre's done this, Ever walked into Vegas with somebody else's money? Yep. And you like, I don't care where I put me and my friends did this one time. We had a hundred bucks somebody else's money. We put it on black. I hit. We put it on red. I hit. We put up. I will say this. You can ask Tony Patterson. You can ask Aston Osai, former Gover. You can ask Jared Ellerson. You can ask Yuki Dozier, Antoine Burns, all former Govers. They were with me. I turned a hundred dollars into eighteen hundred dollars in about five minutes. Why? Because it wasn't my money. I was riding free, and that's what Mickey Joseph is doing right now. He's playing with somebody else's money, and he is going to have this team loose and carefree. Watch for a, a bubble screen, a double pass, some type of flea flicker. 
They're going to do something because they are like, who cares what happens? I want to show another athletic director that maybe I deserve to be a head coach. Maybe Nebraska. I mean, maybe he wins enough games down the stretch. They're like, man, this guy has these kids playing, but he's going to have fun. So I'm going to give the edge to him. So what you're saying is Nebraska is playing with house money. That's what you're saying. With house money, man, what a great gambling story. We should have more of these on the Gopher pregame show. <laughs> we only have about 90 seconds left. I can't believe we've made it through an entire show without talking about the quarterback position once. Especially, I mean, Tanner Morgan returned last week. The, the numbers are, are the numbers. There's not going to, you know, pop your eyes out of your head when you look at the box score. But Tanner Morgan, 14 to 21 last week. Uh, this is an opportunity, I think, for him as well to show that, hey, I'm still part, a big part of this offense here too. Like Justin was saying in his key to the game, maybe pick apart that, that secondary. That really And the great. receivers are yeah. doing them a justice sometimes. Yeah, you know, he correct. could be 17 or 18 for correct. 21. And I think that's the key in this. Tanner Morgan, it's the song. You don't know what you got till it's gone. All the all the Gophers fans were like, oh, Tanner needs to retire, man. Let's let's just put him to the pasture. Let's let Ethan Calic Manis take over. He is good. He's the most winningest quarterback in Gophers history. This kid can get it done, and we saw the difference in having him in versus Ethan. Ethan's going to be really good, I think, in the future, but he's young, and he has to get his experience in there. Tanner has it. Tanner can take this team to a 9-3 and three season to finish the season out. And like what P.J. Fleck told us earlier this week on the P.J. Fleck Show, when he had that conversation about who was going to be the starter moving forward, was it going to be Tanner, was it going to be Ethan? Ethan was the one rooting on Tanner and said, you know, this is Tanner's job. It has been his job. Yeah. That's the kind of respect that Tanner Morgan has in that Minnesota locker room, and we will see how things play out today when Minnesota takes on Nebraska. Thank you so much for joining us here on the Gopher pregame show. Enjoy the game, everybody. We'll see you back here next Next week. that were in the attic that people were excited for the holidays to come but Lamar County Emergency Management tells us that there are at least 50 homes that are damaged or major damage 10 people injured at least 10 people injured and no fatalities they tell us that the wedge cloud came in west of Paris touched down in Paris and then possibly went up again and then retouched down here in Powderly. And the Mar County Emergency Management said that he had first responders that were staged here in Powderly ready to go. 
and uh, we're rescuing people from trapped homes, possibly like this one, trying to get people and children out of the home. So right now, first responders have been on scene all evening and into Saturday to try to assess this damage. Peyton Yeager, Fox 4 News. And thank you so much to our Fox 4 Dallas team for that report. They have reporters all over that area covering it from each and every angle.